question from the back. Okay, that's just part one, as we were saying, five to two. We're going to start singing a bit now once we've finished with Ellie today. So we're going to full trial lecture every time. We we'll won't fall asleep. Um, but today and on Friday, we're going to manage teaching environments. So we have a key feature and the design principle we've got there. And we've said about the, where it came from. And so with this initial part, we've got some of the um, existing systems as well, how they compared to uh, .NET. Peter Microsoft didn't invent it all by new. He looked around the competitors of what people were using, what worked, what didn't work, and tried to build something that made the well, took the best features from other people, um, along with the kind of thing that Microsoft wanted to develop itself. So we'll look at basically today and on Friday, I mean, what is the execution, why it's necessary, some of the key features of managed environments. And again, these are the kind of things we expect you to, in an exam, for example, be able to describe. So we've got more material, we'll wait more to the exams, more to the theory side of it. And the, the data starts to become more of the practical side related to the um, coursework. So again, some of the stuff we'll do today, we'll cover in next week's lab. So again, you'll have practice some of this. So we'll look at some examples of my environments, so not just .NET, but some, some of those, some quite simple ones, but some older ones. Again, the kind of things that the Microsoft engineers are aware of and are familiar with when we're developing .NET. I'll look a little bit more about the .NET environment itself. So, some instruction for that, and the next sort of three weeks after that, we'll look in more detail at this. Basic computer science, computers run programs. You know that, so you typically got hardware, what it does is determined by the final bit, which is the software. There's a hoop mesh software first year, and it's talking about what is software. So, if you all know what software is, again, it's a key, key thing to think about. Historically, you write code, which gives you actual instruction for how to do something. Historically, you can use any command for the hardware to do anything it's capable of. And so the code we wrote originally, we then dumped it into the memory, and it's taken the switch my instruction to the CPU and executed. So a full control of the CPU on the system hardware. Then it gives you very fast code, very compact programs, very small operating systems, obviously it's capable of taking the code from memory, passing it to the CPU, CPU then take over, take the rest of the code, line by line, pull it through, and execute it. Um, again, the basic system using now, the sort of Intel model, PC is using, we're still using it based. Fundamentally, there's that potential there with them. But operating system has changed a lot since then. So the first IBM PC, its version of either um, Microsoft Disk Operating System or then S DOS. Lots of the air open systems that they for it. That's what they all did basically. You couldn't do anything else, anything to the system. Every program on the system had equal access to all the hardware of our system. They had all the memory, all the available disk. Um, the first time MPCXT, you can have to also access the, the tape recorder that you plug in and load your programs off the, off the cassette. Um, so again, it was sick. Very, all the hardware, very simple approach. At that point, the underlying hardware is making the program execute. The CPU takes instruction, looks at what instruction is telling it to do, carries out the instruction, and there's the next one. That's the remote that brings the data onto the stack, converts onto registers, combines the data off the stack. Whatever it is, it's got full access to all the hardware. And again, the typical traditional computing cycle was fetch the instruction, decode it, carry it out. So fetch, decode, execute. All the instructions were a bit patterns. You get the other programmers, they program by the early ones, patch leads, take your cables, connect base connections together, 
for the computer. Thing more complicated, you were able to use punch cards. Write your program, convert it to a of a card, put the card in the machine, it would make or break electrical connections and throw it on the hardware. Later on, that could type home to an interactive VDU, high tech. But it's still often to see, we're all part of bits. Internal computing would be a simple model where you have a simple set of instructions, values, simple hardware, like the accumulator, which is simple as that. The control register to tell the computer which is to go to, and the list of instructions on what to do. Again, programming doesn't work by typing either the instructions directly, but you get the, the book of the send, send instructions that tell you what the command to load the value onto the stack was. Might be bytes 0000001. Type that command into your program. Type in the value you want to load, and to load a 2, 000010. Type that in, and it will load a number 2 onto the stack. Programming is very slow and very error prone. Mistype the 001. And this would be completely different. The sender made it better because it was going to put stuff in the commands, it looked more like they expect. But it's still sort of cumbersome to program with. Computing machines, that's how they worked. Smash the baby, it's probably quite powerful, it's probably one of your different watches, much less powerful than a mobile phone. But it was used for computing. And yeah, programming on that, what that was done by Patsweeds. Connect things together on the front of it to program it. There are a few K of RAM available, program that RAM by the patch leads, and then it would be able to do some functional programming. Then the baby only had seven instructions, seven things you could do. You could add something, pop things on the stack, take them off the stack. It was very limited. We still do things effectively. You get better to computers, I could do very simple things many times. And you complicated tasks. Obviously, in modern uh, risk or CISC processor, will have lots of instructions. You know, thousands or things like Intel nowadays, tens of thousands of instructions. So, you have more instructions. But essentially, the hardware is still as done. The CPU will do whatever you ask it to do, including the crash. Now, back to UIT, software design hardware. Hardware is typically right up through the software, we all know that. Um, apart from some quite strangely badly designed things, like an access center called a pet, you can't break hardware into software. That was one of the few exceptions where you could actually overload the machine by, you put set values onto one of the memory registers, it actually overheated one of the virtual uh, means chip, chip elements and broke the machine. That's not a problem nowadays. But around control, software can break the operating system by flashing it. What about BIOS flashing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's wrong. That's some software on it. It's a hardware issue, though. It's not an operating system issue at that point. It's the, that is an engineer's fault. Okay. But yeah, you can break things by trying to blow the um, overwrite the BIOS. You can't even write a normal program. It's the application you might see in, well, in Windows, but that you rewrite the BIOS. You do have to boot into a special program, but then you rewrite the firmware. Okay. <coughs> but you can't sort of break machines, physically and software terms. So that's pretty much your main concern would be software terms. So breaking from a software point of view, you're usually breaking the actual operating system so the computer stops working. I was trying to prove it nowadays by abstracting from the, the physical runtime, the hardware, into a virtual runtime, to software. So to make your program job easier, you can actually express the program in an abstract way. It's a good way for them to think about how you add numbers by taking the number <coughs> and putting it onto the stack, taking the number and putting it onto the stack, taking that to construction, to make the CPU to add the things, the CPU then popping the stack twice, taking the two 